Okay, is the mic, yes, it's working. Uh, so what I mean by rich authorization is authorizations that go way beyond uh, simple things like, like passwords and HMACs or even um, asymmetric key digital signatures. Um, what I mean by a resource-constrained device is uh, specifically very small amounts of memory. Uh, talking about hundreds of bytes, not kilobytes, and certainly not megabytes. Um, the implementation of this, uh, some of you people know about TPM policies and TPM 2.0. That's an implementation of it. Uh, if you're interested in that, great. Even if you're not interested in TPM 2.0, I hope that this will trigger some thinking about um, what you can do as far as authorizations uh, using very small amounts of memory. Um, a typical example of what you would authorize is a key like a, a public key or a symmetric use of a symmetric key, um, but it goes way beyond that as well into uh, clocks, uh, memory and uh, non-volatile memory administrative commands, and I'll try to give a lot of examples of it. Um, I'm going to start with a few slides on the, the mechanism, how, how it works underneath, but then I want to go pretty quickly into uh, use cases. So this is an example of an immediate um, assertion where the entity over on the left uh, has a single policy digest represented by policy C. Um, in order to uh, satisfy the policy, you start a session. The session has, again, a single session digest. Um, it starts at zero. And then you send in a bunch of policy commands. And here I show three commands. Um, if the commands uh, verify correctly, um, then the session digest gets extended in the, in the TPM sense where um, you take the old digest, you append some data to it, you hash that, and you get a new digest. So these digests accumulate as the commands come in, and it goes from A to B to C. Um, once you get to C, uh, you're ready to actually run uh, the command that you've authorized. At that time, it's a simple mem compare of the digest that's in the policy of the entity to the digest that's in the session. And in this case, they match. They're both C, and um, the, the authorization succeeds. Uh, these are called immediate assertions because the validation is done when the policy command is sent in. So there are these three commands. Uh, and they're checked at the time the command is sent in, not at the time you're running the actual, not at the time that you're using the, the key or the entity. There's another concept called deferred authorizations here where you send in a policy command and it just updates the session state. Um, something could be checked at this time, but typically it's deferred, and then at runtime when you send in the command, uh, and the command parameters, it's checked against the session state, and so the validation is done at the time that you're using the entity. And I will give examples of all of these. Um, so if I go back one slide, if you think about the way uh, a hash works, uh, this becomes an, a, an, an AND function, where you need all three of these commands to succeed, if one of them fails, then there's no way to get from a digest of zero to a digest of C. So it becomes an and, and you can accumulate, in this case I show three, but an unlimited number of, uh, of commands, and the, uh, there is still one single digest in the session. So memory doesn't grow no matter how many um, policy commands you send in. And then the obvious question would be, well, can I do an OR? And the answer, of course, is yes. Uh, the way that an OR works is um, the entity has a policy digest, which, which is a hash of all the AND policies. So if you look over on the left, there's an AND policy C, which was the one from the previous slide. And then there's other AND policies, D, E, and F, 
they get hashed together to policy N. Um, the way that this is satisfied is you start a session, you have a session digest starts at zero, as before it progresses from A to B to C, and at that time you send in this, policy, this special command called policy or with a list of digests, and the list here is C, D, E, and F. Uh, the device will look for a match against one of them. If one of them matches, then we know everything is okay. We replace the session digest C with the session digest N, the hash of the list. They match, and everything is good. You're good to go. You're authorized. So a summary, um, there, it, there are immediate assertions, which are done at the time that you send in the policy command. Deferred assertions are done at the time that you're actually trying to use the authorization. There are AND terms and there are OR terms, and I should say that you're not limited to a, a bunch of ANDs and then a single OR. You can do uh, a series of OR terms, you can do a series of OR terms and then more AND terms uh, to any complexity that you like, and the key is that through all of this, there's just one digest. Um, just as a, as a level set, the most complicated policies that I've seen have typically about three or four AND terms and three OR terms. I haven't seen anything more complex than that, but there's nothing in the design that limits this at all. Um, let's see, okay. Uh, each entity has, one, has a policy that is one fixed size digest. Um, something else that's very nice is that if we add more authentication types in the future, if we add more policy commands, the structure of the key doesn't change and the structure of the session doesn't change. So everything is backward compatible. You can add more features without changing any of the existing structures. Um, the session just has one fixed size state plus any deferred authorizations. Um, Something else that might not be obvious is that the policy calculation, the policy contains no secrets. It might have public keys, but it doesn't have private keys, it doesn't have passwords or anything like that. What this means is that you can pre-calculate the policies offline, and you might have in an, ent if in, in an entity, you might have um, each platform has its own signing key. Each of the signing keys will be unique, but if the business logic is the same, they'll, have, they'll all have the same policy hash. The, the value of the policy will be the same. Okay, some use cases. Um, the most easy to understand, perhaps, is policy command code. This is an authorization that's linked to a particular command. Um, it's deferred in that um, the policy command just says, in the future, you need to check that a certain command code is running. Um, some use cases of this. So in the TCG world, there's this thing called a quote, which is a signed attestation. But you can think of, of other signings or other commands. So you can take a key and you can say, I, I'm going to restrict this key to only certain types of signing, only a quote. You can take a symmetric key and you, you can say um, the policy for this command, uh, I can only use it to encrypt, I can't use it to decrypt. Um, another very common use is for memory. If you want to have um, certain policies for writing, which might be more restrictive, and other policies for reading, which are um, more liberal, you would use this policy command code and you would have one OR term for writes and another OR term for reads. Um, delegation, so uh, you might have some uh, very highly privileged um, administrative um, tasks and you can say, okay, we will have an OR term here, for example, for a firmware update and you'll say, well, okay, here's the policy for a firmware update and it might be more or less relaxed or certainly different than another administrative command like, like rebooting or something like that. So that's what you would use command code for. Um, 
Authorization value and password are also fairly straightforward. Um, this is saying in order to authorize this, uh, you need a password or, or an HMAC of the parameters. A very common thing would be to combine that with policy command code, which would say, um, say to do a memory write, you need a password. Uh, to do a memory read, you don't need a password. So you would have those two R terms. That's a very common use case. Okay, now a more, a more complicated one. And I'm gonna put my glasses on for this one. Nope, yes I am. Um, so this is, this is an authorization tied to a digital signature. Um, it has uh, parameters such as a nonce, which would say I'm gonna sign this authorization but it can only be used once. Uh, you can lock it to the command parameters so you can say I'm only going to, I can, I'm authorizing this but only for certain parameters. Policy reference I'll get to a second, in a second and an expiration, so you can say, okay, I'm, I'm signing, I'm authorizing you to use this key, um, but only for the next half an hour, or only for the weekend when I come back on Monday, you lose your authorization. Um, use cases, um, authorization using a smart card, so you can have a smart card or other HSM signing an authorization to do something. Uh, you might have Say your, um, your device here is being used as a CA to sign some software, but you don't want to allow anyone to use that CA, so you can authorize the CA itself with a smart card, something like that. Um, biometric, if your biometric can do digital signatures, you can authorize, say, with a fingerprint reader. And this is where the policy reference comes along, because you don't want to say, um, anybody's fingerprint who matches works, works, you might want to say only Alice's fingerprint um, or only Bob's fingerprint. So that's this policy reference. And of course, because you can have or terms, you can say, well, Alice is authorized with just her fingerprint. Bob needs a fingerprint and a password, something like that. Um, Authorization from a help desk or customer support. So supposing a help desk wants to do something on your system so they can, or give you privilege to do something on, this, on your system, they can give you a digital signature over at their IT support department to permit you to do something. Um, delegating your key during your absence. So you might be able to use your key with password uh, but you might give a signed authorization to someone, to someone else to use it with their password um, just while you're at lunch. Um, firmware update is a typical example of how you would sign certain command parameters. So supposing you have a platform and you say, um, I want to permit a firmware update, but only this particular firmware update. So then you would, you would sign that, uh, say, a hash of that firmware update. Policy secret is a level of indirection. Uh, this says um, you're not using the password tied to this entity. You're using a password that's contained in some other entity. A, a typical use case of this, you would put the password um, as the password of an NV index. And you would tell all of your keys, don't, don't use the key, don't use the password associated with this key, use the password that's in this NV index. Um, it permits you to have one password controlling a bunch of keys. Um, it also allows you to change the password for all these keys by changing one location. Um, and then you can also have, have multiple users. So you can say, okay, I need this password plus this other password. A command parameter hash um, hopefully will seem totally useless to all of you. This is a, a policy that says you can only use certain parameters. So you can say, I have a policy for, that, for this key that can only sign a particular hash, or I can only write a 42 to that NV index. It seems totally useless. I'm telling you that because obviously in a few slides you'll see that it's not useless. Um, policy PCR is perhaps the only one that is TPM specific. Um, 
This is what was in, in 1.2 they called ceiling to PCRs, and the idea is that you can only use this key or this entity or whatever um, if the PCRs are in a certain value, um, if, there is a, if the software is in a certain state, and you can put a selection of PCRs. You can say PCR 0, 1, 2, and 7, um, and uh, you specify what digest is allowed. Um, policy NV, so in policy secret, the, the, the um, value was the password for the NV index. Here the value was the data in an NV index. And you can do compares, you can do greater than, less than, equal to, not equal, um, bitwise operations. Um, typical use cases for this, you can do um, key revocations. So you can have an NV index that's uh, monotonically uh, increasing, and you can say, I'm authorizing uh, this set of keys until a certain value is um, exceeded, and that, that revokes the key for everyone. Uh, because we have bitwise operations, uh, you can create uh, a, a monotonic bitmap index, and if you have 64 bits, you can do individual revocation um, for each of 64 um, people, entities, whatever. Um, you can create an NV index that looks like a PCR in that it can extend, and this gives you a PCR uh, that perhaps has a different hash algorithm than your default, or perhaps it, ha it requires its own authorization. Um, you can put a password in an NV index and say, you know, is the password equal to this? Um, and then you can do AND terms so you can have a range. So you can say uh, the count is uh, greater than three and less than 15. So you can do ranges as well. NV written, this, this one is, is kind of subtle, I think. Um, you can have a policy for the first write before an index is written, and then you can have another policy for subsequent writes. Um, and you would do that in OR terms. Uh, a typical uh, use of this is that if you have some certain privileged application that's going to do the first write, um, when you read later, you can be assured that that privileged uh, user um, initialized the index. It prevents what we call a redefine attack, where if you have an index that you, that you trust, uh, someone could try to attack it by deleting the index and recreating the same index with, a new, with their own password instead of the password that should be there. Well, that fails in this case because, yes, they can do the delete, they can create the new index with their own password, but they can't do that first right because they don't have the, the privilege to do that first right, and because they can't do the first right, they can't do subsequent rights. Counter timer, if you have a system that has a, a clock, a clock in this terminology is something that's, pow that's time uh, powered, uh, timed running when power is on. Let me try that again. A clock that runs when power is on, so it's wall time. Or time in this sense is time since a reboot. And you can have policies that are linked to those two times or a reboot count. Uh, typical use cases, um, if you have a service technician doing something on the system, you might want to give them privilege, uh, but you want to make sure that when they walk out the door, they don't still have that privilege. So if you lock the, uh, the entity to a reboot count, then they walk out, you reboot the system, and whatever authorizations that you gave them are gone. Um, you can authorize until a particular date and time, so you can say this is authorized until Sunday. Um, because you have OR terms, you can say daytime only from 8 in the morning to 5 in the afternoon, or you could say only on weekdays, not on the weekends, et cetera. Uh, so some of the issues. Um, some of the above use cases require the policies to be created at runtime, but you can't do that. An entity, once you create an entity with a password, that's it. There's no 
change the uh, policy. There's no change the policy command, and the reason for that is you might want to certify a key, including its policy, and after you certify it, you don't want that policy to change. And then we have these totally useless policies, like writing uh, specific data to an index, uh, signing a digest. For the people in the TPM world, there was this issue of what we called PCR brittleness, where you seal something to PCRs. Paul talked about this yesterday. Uh, you seal something to PCRs, and then your, your pre-OS firmware changes, and all of a sudden, uh, the, the unsealed breaks. Um, in the 1.2 world, the way this was worked around was you had to read the secret all the way up at the application level, um, and then you had to reseal it to new PCRs, and then you have the, the problem of, well, what are the trusted PCR values? Is it, is it just what I happen to be running? Do I trust whatever's running on my system now? Um, wasn't very nice, uh, but as in all software, uh, we solve it by a level of indirection. And the command is called policy authorize. Um, in words, it says uh, the policy has a public key and the entity is authorized by whatever the authorizing private key says is valid. So the authorizing key signs a policy and whatever the authorizing entity signs, that's the correct policy. In a flowchart, it works like this. So an entity has a policy digest, just like before, a single hash. In this case, the hash is the hash of the authorizing entity's public key. So it's represented here by P. Now, um, in use, the authorizing entity who has the private key calculates a session digest that they trust. Um, they sign that session digest with their private key and they send it over to the user. Now what the user does is as before, they run their policy commands and they get to session digest S. At that point, they apply the policy authorize. If, so the, the device now has the public key, it has the signature, and internally in the session, it has the, the digest, so it can do a signature verification. If everything matches, it replaces the session digest with this uh, value PPP, and you're good to go. Um, and of course, good to go means uh, maybe you're ready to authorize, or you can have more and terms after that. So how does, how does it solve some of these weird things? So writing fixed data to an NV index doesn't work very well, but I know of a use case where uh, a platform, and, and this is, I guess, very common in big systems, a platform is shipped with huge amounts of memory and lots of CPUs, and then the user can buy for a certain amount of time use of five CPUs, and then if there's a, a, a crunch where they need to use more CPUs, they can purchase more CPUs. Um, so the way that would work here is um, the authorizer is whoever you're, you're purchasing this, the CPU usage, usage from. Um, they go, you pay them, they sign an authorization to update the NV index, which holds your, uh, how many CPUs you can use. Um, they sign an authorization to update that index that says, yes, I can now use 12 CPUs for the next week. Um, and then you, you run all your policy commands, you apply that authorization, and then you can write the index. Um, signing a specific digest isn't that useful, but uh, in this case, you can go off to the authorizing entity and you can say, I want to sign a particular digest uh, the authorizing entity would say okay and send the authorization back to you. I think this, of this as kind of countersigning. Like uh, if you go and get a bank check, the teller might sign the bank check and then they need to go off and get the bank manager's signature if it's over a certain amount or maybe if it's not over a certain amount. Well, this would be the same thing. Maybe you're um, a, a software development group um, and you have, you have some new firmware and you want to sign that firmware hash. Uh, 
uh, but in order to sign the firmware hash, you need um, authorization from management or authorization from your quality control group. So it's kind of a counter countersigning. You need one signer to approve the other signer. Um, and then in PCRs, um, this is a way to solve the PCR brittleness problem. What happens here is, uh, say you're a platform vendor or, or a firmware vendor, you have firmware that you know is, is good. You sign an authorization that says this is good firmware and you distribute it out to, out to all the users of your platform. And now when they want to unseal, they're not unsealing to specific PCRs that are set in the policy. They're unsealing to whatever the platform manufacturer says are good PCRs or whatever your IT department says are good PCRs. So it solves the PCR brittleness problem without having to go through this unseal and reseal. Um, it also says um, you can do better than saying what is authorized is whatever I happen to have on my platform. Now what's authorized is what the software vendor says is authorized or what your IT department says is authorized. One more level of indirection. Okay, so, so going back up. So the problem with policy authorized is that it's linked to a public key. Uh, and then at some point people came along and said, well, what happens if I wanna change that public key? What happens if, if the authorizer lost their private key or it expired or you're, you're just switching to a different authorizer and you can never change a policy? Um, so later on in the design, this was not in the original design, but once people discovered this use case, uh, we added a new policy command. And this shows an example of how you can add new policy commands and it's all backward compatible. So no, no existing software broke, but if you have a device that implements this new command, which is called policy authorize NV, then you can do additional things. And what this says is that the policy is not, well, the policy in the, in the index is not the policy, the, the policy in the key or the policy in the entity is not the final policy. The policy is whatever is in this NV index. So it's a pointer to the actual policy in the NV index. Um, the trivial, trivial use case is when you wanna change a policy. Uh, the very important use case is you can uh, revoke a policy authorized public key by writing a different policy into this NV index. Um, you of course have the issue of, well, what's the policy to write this NV index, but that could be, that could be a higher level policy. Um, so that's two use cases for policy authorized NV. And to summary, all this in a $1 part, which I think is pretty impressive. Um, there's only one digest per entity. So for example, for CHA256, it's just 32 bytes. And I gave you some examples of, of some business processes, but you can go on and on as complex as you like, and it's still only 32 bytes. The session is opaque. You don't see the, int, the uh, innards of the session context from outside. So if we want to add more policy commands, uh, that again is backward compatible. Um, assuming that you already have crypto in your system, uh, hashing, HMAC, uh, asymmetric and symmetric key operations, um, then it's low software overhead. If you look at the TPM source code and it's all open source, uh, yeah, there's a lot of crypto that's shared by other things, but the, um, the software to do one of these policy commands is actually very small. Uh, what I mean by proven usefulness is uh, we keep coming up with more and more use cases. And um, you know, I get email from people asking me how to do use cases. And except for that one level of indirection, which we, which we added later, um, Everything that we've wanted to do, we've been able to do, and that's, that's a testament to the, to the people who originally designed this, who was not me. Um, uh, 
but the fact that it's been this flexible over this many years is, I think, very impressive. And lastly, it's not as hard as I thought. The, I don't know what you're thinking now, but the first time I saw this, I thought, oh, this is really complicated. Nobody's going to be able to get this, or it's going to take a long time for people to get it, or they're going to have to read the documentation forever. And what I'm finding through mailing lists is that people are, people are really getting it. People who I never heard of, a lot of them seem to be graduate students or even undergraduates at universities who are starting to play with TPMs. They're coming to me with policies and they understand it and you know, that I really feel good about that. So that's the talk, I'm ready for questions. Anyone? Ah, someone who's not hungry. <laughs> So you asked two questions when you had one last time, so <laughs> I don't know. Uh, does the policy authorize uh, have rollback protection? Because it's uh, only the key that's to be signed. Ah, um, so it can if you want to, or it doesn't have to. So there were those nonces on some of the previous slides I showed that there is a nonce. So you can, you can do a signature that says it's only good for this one session. Oh, I should say that also. A session, once it's authorized, can only be used once. Uh, if, you, if you want to uh, do something again, you have to start over at zero and satisfy it again. If there are no nonces, you can replay. Uh, if there are nonces involved, when you reset the session, there's a new nonce and I think that's what you mean by anti-rollback, or it's not, no. Which, which example was that? Uh, in the example that you described where uh, a vendor uh, pre-calculating the PCRs uh, in case of firmware update and signing those PCR, expected PCR values with the vendor's uh, private key. I understand. Okay, in that example, so how do you, uh, does that have an element of basically versioning and uh, to give the rollback protection? Okay, so there is not, I'll, I'll give you two, okay, you, we, you allow, we allow you two questions, you have to allow me two answers. Um, so, so the first answer is by itself there's no anti-rollback, but you can do things with say counters. So you can say um, the policy says, the policy that I'm authorizing saying, says that the counter has to be um, less than three and greater than three. So you, so you start less than three, you run the, the policy command, and then you increment to greater than three, and it's satisfied, but you can't use it again because once it's greater than three, you can't get to less than three again. So by itself, there's no anti-rollback, uh, but in combination, like I said, there's so much here that you can find a way to do things and that's the way you would do it. So that's one answer. The other answer is, and when I first went to operating divisions and talked about this, um, they just get in a cold sweat when they hear about no rollback. Uh, because in a lot of places in the real world, um, if you do some kind of firmware update, and it doesn't work, the people that are looking over your shoulder, the first thing they're gonna say is, I don't want you to debug it. Put it back the way it was, get me back up and running, and then go back home and figure out what went wrong. Okay, so that's the two answers. Is yes, you can do it in combination with these monotonic counters, and there's probably other ways to do it as well. Um, whether you want to do it, well, you have talk to the people that are uh, you know maintaining your systems. You might not want them to, or they might not want you to. More questions? So, so how do we create these policies? I mean, is there is there some tools or? Oh, great question. Um, will you allow me three answers? <laughs> so, so one. Uh, if I can go way back here. Um, so when you start this session, it starts off at zero, and then as you send in these policy commands, it updates. 
there's a feature in the TPM that's called a trial policy. And what the trial policy says is two things. First, all of these policy commands that comes in are not, are not validated. They're just trusted to be good, so no signatures are checked, no passwords are checked, nothing. But you can't use that policy, the, that session at the end for authorization. So you can actually use the TPM to calculate the policies, and I've seen that. Um, I also ha I have some very primitive tools where you're just cut and pasting hex ASCII. Um, they're not very good, uh, but people are actually using them. I'm shocked that people are actually using them. Now, in the TCG, um, they have this vision of using uh, JSON. I, it was originally uh, XML, and I think it's JSON, uh, where you specify the policies in JSON. They're somewhat human readable, uh, and then you have a tool to take that JSON and turn it into a hash. Um, it, it will be nice if there are tools to generate the JSON. If you have to generate the JSON by hand, I'm not sure that it's any better or much better than the really primitive tools that I've open sourced. Um, but if there are eventually um, GUI tools to generate that JSON, that'll be terrific. Um, the other thing about that JSON for better, and it may or may not be useful, we'll have to see, is that you can imagine once you have the policy um, expressed in JSON, it's not only good for uh, calculating the policies, but it's good at runtime where your software, say, suppose you have three policy or terms. Well, your software can present to the user and say, which of these three do you want me, the software, to satisfy? And the user can say, well, I'll, I'll, I pick uh, policy B, and it can run through that. Uh, so that might be a very useful uh, use of JSON. What I've seen so far in these OR terms is that the business logic for the software already knows what it's trying to do. It doesn't have to come back to the user and say that. But that doesn't mean that it won't be useful in the future. If we, there might be use cases where the business logic has a bunch of choices that it can do, and remember, you can have ORs of ORs of ORs, and in that case, the JSON might turn out to be very useful. So did that kind of answer your question three times? Yeah, <laughs> okay. And you know, by the way, um, I don't know how we're doing on time, but I'm here all day today and tomorrow. Uh, it's, uh, we're right on lunchtime, so. Oh, okay. Uh, no uh. more questions? Okay, thanks, Ken. Thank you.